How many men in the house, you would say you are terrible gift givers? Come on. Okay, let me ask the ladies. Ladies, how many of your men are terrible gift givers? Come on. Yes, that's more like it. Um, so here's the reality. I, on behalf of all men on the planet, um, I would just like to tell you that we try. Men, come on, help me out. Don't leave me up here. We try. We want to do better. And you say like, well, if you want to do better, why don't you do better? And we, we don't know. Because we don't, we don't know what we don't know. And in, in fairness, some of y'all are hard to understand. And we're not real smart, are we, man? Come on. Okay, we not. Okay, so I am a terrible gift giver. I try. Um, and, 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 I, and so I asked my wife last, this past week, can you help me? Um, can you help me with this illustration that I want to do Sunday about gifts and like, what are some, some bad gifts that I ever gave you? She goes, oh yeah, I got plenty of those, okay? So that's how bad it is. <laughs> um, but let, let's see, how many of y'all like the, the types of gifts y'all like? Like, I mean, y'all got kids, they like to get candy. My 10-year-old, every time we go through the line at Target or Walmart or Ingalls, on behalf of all parents in America, please move the candy from the checkout. Come on, somebody. He, he will get money from his grandparents when we go on vacation, and all he wants to do is spend it on candy. He loves that. How many of y'all like, um, how many of y'all like gift cards? Gift cards? Anybody? All right, I'm not giving them away, so I don't get too excited. Um, Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' Donuts? Which one? I love this. Now all in unison, we'll, we'll, I know this, the house is very divided, so let's bring it back together. Apple or Android? Apple. See? See, like three centers over here. And so... Um, <laughs> How many of you guys like to receive cash? Come on, money? Woo! Now, let me just pause for a second. Ladies, this is the problem. If you say you like to receive cash, and then we give you $100 and say, go spend it on your birthday, you're like, that's not a gift. <laughs> so let me get this right. You want the cash and a gift. <laughs> I don't. See, we thought you just. See, what just happened is you went, woo, and he's like, sweet, I'll give her cash for her birthday. And she's going to look at you like this. Do you see? We trying, all right? How many of y'all, um, you like ladies, you like candles? Come on. Lamp candles? All right. Uh, Bath and Body Works candles, anybody? This is what this one is. Um, um, so candles. And then I have kids that, like my youngest, he, he always wants toys. And then how many of y'all got toys around your house that aren't even open? Yep. Um, all right, let me pause. How many of you ladies got stuff in your closet you never even worn? <laughs> yeah, it's, she's like, me, okay, okay. Right, so... Um, true story. Uh, so my wife, um, about, I don't know, Julie said, but this was three or four months ago, I decided, um, Bath and Body Works was having a sale. And, uh, any, you, you know, like those sales where like they, they, oh, everything's like three times what it should be in there. Um, but then they have these sales to make you think you're getting a good deal. And so, um, I went in and I bought this, it was during the summer sale. This is firecracker pop. And I'm like, girl, you a firecracker. So I bought, I bought this one, right? And I bought all these, and I'm, I just smell them, and I'm like, okay, she would smell good in that, you know. And so uh, I bought these things, and I brought them home, and then she just laughed. I'm like, you love Bath and Body Works. Um, why are you laughing? And she said, because you bought the sample. <laughs> to which I'm like... I can't do anything right. <laughs> I went through and I was smashed. And so now all the cooties from everybody else is on this. And I'm like, I was so excited. It was, I even put it in a basket that she could use the basket for later, right? But the memory we have is try me. <laughs> so it, her, a few years ago, um, I think it was birthday, Christmas, I don't know. We were walking through the store and she saw this um, crock pot, triple crock pot. Like, it had three different things. First of all, why you need all that? And she goes, oh, that's cool. I'm like, sweet. I filed that in the back of my mind. I'm going I'm on, I'm on to surprise her. Y'all, see, you ladies are shaking your head. What do I not know? <laughs> I look over here, and she's like, mm-mm. She don't want that. I'm like, how am I supposed to know she don't want it? So I go get it, wrap it up. I put it on the counter for her birthday. I'm like, girl, that's you up triple wide crock pot. 
she opens this thing and she goes, huh. I said, you, what do you mean, huh? And she said, well, I said, you, we were walking through the other, like two weeks ago, and you pointed at it, and you said, that's cool. She goes, that don't mean I want it. <laughs> Yo, I don't, I still don't get it. Men, you should come back next Sunday, because this is us, right? I don't get, I don't know, but we try. But we are uninformed and ignorant when it comes to gift giving for the most part, right? If you have a man in your life and he is the best at giving gifts, please, we will do a class. We will do a small group for men on this, okay? The Paul, you say, where are we going with this? Paul, a follower of Jesus who started New Testament church, which is all across uh, the then known world, writes to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts. Brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Now let's pause for a second. What he's saying is that God has some spiritual gifts for his children. <laughs> and some of y'all are confused. He even goes on to say, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. In other words, he's saying you got caught up in things that weren't true when you were pagans. You, you got caught up in what you wanted to follow. And he says, therefore, in verse 3, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. He's saying, listen, y'all got all kinds of confusion about spiritual gifts, who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit's role is, and as we've been unpacking this series, he reconfirms this in chapter 12. He's telling us that First and foremost, the Holy Spirit convinces the world of sin. We talked about this last week. And he's saying that there's a gift that God gave us when Jesus left the earth, the Holy Spirit, who convinces the world of sin. We went on to say last week that he convinces us of our righteousness when we look at, uh, we look at John chapter 14, 15, and 16. And then he says he convinces us that we win. What does he mean by that? That we are made righteous through Jesus, the Holy Spirit is convincing us that it's only through Jesus and because of Jesus that we are made righteous and that we can rest in that. And then at the end of the day, he convinces the world that the enemy is going to be judged and that we're going to win. And now we're in Corinth years later. And Paul is addressing questions that the church at Corinth had. Now let me just give you a little snapshot on the, how the flow of First and Second Corinthians go. The Corinthians had written to Paul a list of questions that they wanted answered. I mean, they were like, well, let me ask you this. What about marriage? What about divorce? What about sex? What about the spiritual gifts? They're writing all these things to Paul. Well, before Paul addresses these questions that the church at Corinth has, he spends six chapters ripping them a new one. Because he's like, y'all are so jacked up. I can tell you all these things, but y'all got to get some stuff right. They got incest in their church. They got lying in their church. They got immorality in their church. They got gossip and slander. The women are in the balcony screaming at the men. They're separate. It is wild, y'all. And then in, he starts six or seven chapters in saying, now about the questions you asked. But I needed to get that off my chest. I just wonder sometimes if Paul wouldn't write to us as the church in America and say, before I answer the questions you have, let me address the issues you have. And that's what he's done. And now he comes to chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. And the Corinthian church, man, they were, how do I say this? They were kind of acting weird. And they were all up in these spiritual gifts. And they were freaking people out by the way they were operating in these spiritual gifts. Now, Paul goes on to talk about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. And we're going to look more at that next week. Because, because I think he doesn't want us to be uninformed today either. But before we do, what I want us to do today foundationally is lay a little foundation or look back a little deeper as to what it means to, first of all, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit or be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, in the church at Corinth, they are running around speaking in tongues and prophesying. And it, it's just become this whole thing of uh, just chaos, to be honest with you. And Paul is going to speak to them and say, y'all are just wild and out of control. You say, Carl, why are we talking about these things? Well, let me give you several things. First of all, I just believe this. There's been a lot of unhealthy teaching on the gifts of the Spirit in the church and the Holy Spirit in general. 
It's divided. Where are, my, where are my Catholic people at? Come on. Let's do this again. All right. So y'all see? They're like, okay. Where are my Pentecostal people at? Watch this. Okay, and then there's everything. Where are my Baptists? All y'all others are Baptists, right, or Methodists, right? So we got people from all walks of life with all different teachings about the Holy Spirit. And, all, and we've, we've seen the church in America divide over this issue. Why? Because it's weirded people out. It's freaked people out, and there's been unhealthy doctrine. And I would argue, in many cases, spiritual abuse around these things. And some of you come from backgrounds, and if you come from more of a reserved background, and uh, you're kind of you're kind of like, okay, how, what's this all, all going to be about? If you come from Pentecost, you're like, this is my story. Come on, let's do this. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull everything and probably land somewhere in between, okay? And so the Corinthian church, though, they're out of their mind. They're losing their mind. And Paul says, y'all, 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 we want to address this. We want to inform you of some stuff. And so. Before we get to what he says to the Corinthian church, I want us to rewind today and talk about when we first see the Holy Spirit's work in the lives of believers after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, okay? And so we see Acts chapter 2. This is a a landmark verse if you grew up in a Pentecostal church, Um, and it's a very controversial verse if you didn't. And so what's happening in Acts chapter 2 is there is uh, his disciples, the followers of Jesus, are in an upper room. They have gone to wait in an upper room, and they are waiting on the Holy Spirit to come. And there are people that are gathered around for the Feast of Pentecost, as we would know it, from all different tribes, all different nations, all different languages, okay? And the Bible says that after waiting, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and they begin to speak in all these other tongues. And it weirded some people out. Some people are like, they're drunk. It's only nine in the morning. How many have they had? That was the questions. If you read the passage. And then Peter stands up and addresses the crowd because what it says in Acts chapter 2 was that all those people that came from different you know, countries, different cities, different, and spoken different languages, heard them praying and speaking in their native language. Now let's pause. Uh, most of us in this room speak one language. I know my name is Carlos. You would think I speak more. I speak one. I know. Me llamo Carlos. That's it. Okay. And so... Um, But at the end of the day, most of us have one primary language. If, by chance, people from all nations, even 25 nations, came and gathered around this auditorium right now in this moment, and we all began to speak in their native languages without no studying, without no nothing, and they heard it clearly in their language, the gospel of Jesus, would that be a miracle? That's all that happened. And what the Holy Spirit is at work doing, ready? Ready? convincing the world that they need a savior reiterating the fact that jesus is who he says he is and so this is what happens and now people are like okay you got to explain this now peter stands up and addresses the crowd before we read this uh, peter stands up and addresses the crowd and peter is called by god to carry the gospel to the world and i'm gonna tell you a little bit more about his story in a minute throw verse 38 uh, up on the screen again for me in the back he says this Peter replied, as they're asking questions, repent and be baptized. This is the first message that we ever see preached in the New Testament church. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That's me and you, right? Now, before we look at this, let's understand who Peter is. Um, Peter was one of Jesus' closest followers, closest friends. Um, But but there's some things that have happened in Peter's life. He was a little bit compulsive. Peter did some pretty crazy stuff. In fact, Peter uh, comes to Jesus at one point when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross. And he says, I can't let you go to the cross because Peter had selfish motives. I'm not going to let you die on the cross. And Jesus literally looks at Peter and says this, get behind me, Satan. Now, um, I've been called a lot of names in life. That's not one of them. But what what is happening here, and I need you to hear this. When somebody tries to undermine God's calling on your life, they are not operating in the Spirit of God. And what Jesus is saying is don't manipulate me by your own insecurities. So people talking to you and undermining anything about the mission of Christ, you need to understand the Spirit by which that comes from. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Now, don't make a practice of just calling people Satan. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Some of y'all are like, sweet, I can't wait to see her this week. Um, <laughs> but Peter 
is now Jesus goes in the garden of Gethsemane. He's praying before he goes to the cross. He's sweating like drops of blood. Peter's falling asleep. He's supposed to be praying, but Peter's falling asleep. And Jesus is like, why wake up? And Peter's falling asleep. He's like, wake up and pray. Now Jesus is going and he's being, he's standing, um, basically, he's on trial for something he now, I mean, he's going to die for the sins of the world. And three different times Peter is addressed asking, do you know this Jesus? I think I've seen you with Jesus. Don't you know Jesus? And he says three different times, I don't even know what you're talking about. The third time he calls down curses on himself. He's like, I don't know. Curse, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about this Jesus. Now let me ask you for a second. How is it that Peter, standing up on the day of Pentecost, now stands up and declares to the world the power of God? When just a few chapters later, earlier, weeks earlier, he's like, I don't even know the man. Jesus restores Peter after his resurrection. He says, no, I still have a plan for you. And history records that Peter would later be crucified upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Savior. Now, how is it that a man can be crucified upside down, but at one point in his life, he was scared to even acknowledge that he knew Jesus for fear of being crucified? One reason, the power of the Holy Spirit. That was the only difference. And he said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, is what Jesus tells him. We'll read it in a minute. And so Peter preached his very first message that day that launched what we know as the New Testament church. The greatest movement in all of history. And what he tells us is this. There's more. There's more for your life. Now let me just pause. So many of you have walked through your life and and you feel defeated in your spiritual walk. You feel like you're constantly losing. Today is for you. Okay? Let's look at it. He tells us there are three important moments, baptisms, encounters, whatever you want to call them, in the life of every believer. And I think this is true for all of us. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, the first one's for you. If you are a follower of Jesus, all three are for you. The first one is this. He says, first of all, the first one is salvation. Now, you say, what is salvation? He says in verse 38, you repent. For salvation to occur, you must repent. What does repent mean? It means to turn from your past. Let me give you a definition of salvation. It is the miraculous work of grace upon the human heart. Somewhere along the line, we were headed for an eternity apart from Jesus. In our sin, doing our own thing, making our own poor choices, and grace entered into our heart. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit came in and said, hey, I've got a bigger plan for your life. God has a bigger plan for your life. And we repented of our sin. What that meant is we turned from our sin and turned toward God. Turned from our sin and turned toward God. We didn't back our way to God. Come on. We turned because what you look at long enough, here's what I say. If you window shop long enough, you'll eventually make a purchase. So we turn from those things. We turn from it and we run from it and we run to God. And so we're running this race toward God to to fulfill his purposes for our life. That's what repentance means. I turn from this and run toward God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says that this, by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. Not works, not anything you could do. It's not by yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no man can boast. What he's saying is this, it is God's power at work through the Holy Spirit convicting you of your sin to turn from your past. And then he goes on to say, once you've done that, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things are becoming new. That says all things have become new, but the literal translation there is all things are becoming new, insinuating that there is a process, right? Now let's just talk about it. When your child was born, they were new, but things were becoming new still, right? Do you see the parallel? Let me just, aren't you grateful that there's been some newness in your child's life since they were two and a half years old? Aren't you glad? Some of you are like, I feel like I'm still raising a toddler. Like, aren't you glad that the terrible twos didn't stay that way? Because some new things, some new attitudes, some new behaviors, some new growth. Now I'm walking and talking and leading and married and having my own family. Do you see this? That's what all things have been made new and are becoming new mean. 
And so spiritually speaking, I had a new birth in Christ where I'm like, I, I, I was born in the flesh. Now I want to be born in this spiritual way that like I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm starting a new life in Christ. There's going to be some hiccups along the way. Here's the problem. Too many Christians are stuck as two-year-olds. Too far? We're pouting and whining when we don't get our way. Come on. We're crying because we're like, okay, God, we don't understand. And so we have all these thoughts and all these things toward God. And he said, no, I want you to keep growing. I want you to keep taking steps. I want you. That's why we say at Relevant Church, your next step is your. You see, like, and so for some of you, it's like, we got we to forgive some people. We got to learn some new things. We got to be challenged. We got a lot of people to speak in our life. We got to take that step towards God. He says, the first step is salvation. Here's the second moment in your life, and that is water baptism. Water baptism. He says, be <laughs> baptized. Not think about it. I love people say, I'm praying about whether I should get baptized or not. Why would God already answer questions he already answered? Peter says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. So Peter urges his listeners to follow Jesus' example of water baptism. Now, let me give you a little history. You say, Jesus was baptized? Yes, and it's a pretty significant thing that we see here. There's a man by the name of John the Baptist who came before Jesus. He's known as John the Baptizer because he baptized a lot of people. Who did he baptize and why did he baptize? He was saying that there's one that's coming that's greater than I. He is Jesus. He's the Son of God. I'm baptizing you into his teachings. In other words, when you were baptized into the name of Jesus, you were baptized into believing that Jesus was who he said he was going to be. So now he says, Jesus is coming into this world, and I'm baptizing you in the name of Jesus, but he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He says it this way in Matthew chapter 3. I baptize you with water for repentance, salvation. We just talked about that. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now listen, he, he, just, that's verse 11. You see this, right? So John's like, he's coming. He's going to baptize you in fire. And then Jesus rolls up in there. Two verses later. I don't know how long this was. But then it says, then Jesus came to Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Now I just want you to imagine Jesus rolling up and going, hey man, I need you to baptize me. And John said, um, why, I don't need to baptize you. Why are you coming to me? In other words, he's saying, why would I baptize you? You need to baptize me. What Jesus is about to do is do two things. He's about to be baptized to show that he is who he says he is. You could trust his teachings. And he's about to set an example for all of humanity of what it means to go down and be resurrected. He's symbolic of his death and burial and resurrection. And when we're baptized, it's symbolic of our spiritual death, burial, and resurrection to new life. And he goes on to say, Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John said, well, all right. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, look at this. He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending on him and alighting him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Why, why at this moment did Jesus get validated by his father publicly? Can I tell you? It's because I believe it's a, it's, it's a, very, it's a very, I think, inspirational thing. for when we, Remember when Jesus said, if you, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father, which is in heaven? Jesus said, I'm the son of God to die for the sins of the world. And, and the father said, that's my son in whom I'm well pleased. You understand that when you and I are baptized in water and we go public with our faith, you, your heavenly father smiles upon you. Two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, we had 50 people, 50 people take their next step of water baptism. And I said this at the end of service. I said, listen, some of y'all came in here. Y'all didn't plan to get baptized, but you feel this moment. And you're, you're gone. Listen, we don't have any clothes for you to change into. You're going to go home wet, but you're going to go home obedient. There's nothing magical about water baptism, but there is something magical about obedience. And, and Peter says, repent and be baptized. It's a command. And then God says the same. Listen, you're his son or his daughter, but there's this, 
There's something about that moment where I, I think God goes, see, they're starting the process of following me. That's my son. That's my daughter and whom I am well pleased. And then heaven opens up and falls and descends upon Jesus. How do you think Jesus did the miracles Jesus did on this earth? This is a theological thing we need to wrestle with and not just go with everything that somebody's told us in our life. Can I just suggest an option to you? The Bible says Jesus emptied himself and became a man. But you know what filled him back up? The Holy Spirit. And then he goes around healing people, touching people. He sees the woman at the well and he says, you know what, I know you, listen, you've been married and divorced five times and the, woman, the man you're living with now is not your husband. That's a word of knowledge, right? Jesus know that. He didn't know this woman. The Holy Spirit's operating in Jesus' life to transform the world. And this is the thing that I think we need to understand. Luke tells us in Luke chapter number 11, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Then he goes on to say, or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. That'd be a great YouTube video, but a terrible dad. (laughs) If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Hear me. Let me just talk about water baptism before we go to the third one. When you publicly declare your faith through water baptism, you please your heavenly Father. Let me go on to say, from the model in Jesus' life and from Peter's teaching, here's what we see. When you publicly declare your faith through water baptism, you open up your life to the Holy Spirit's work in your life. And some of us, the reason we're not seeing God work and the Holy Spirit work in our life is our lack of obedience. It's an act of obedience that follows true repentance. So some of you are like, okay, when's the next water baptism? I'm glad you asked. October 16th. Throw it up, myrelin.cc slash baptism. I want to celebrate what God's done in your life with you, and I want to see you open up to the blessings of God on your life by being obedient. Here's the third one. The third major component or moment I'm in a believer's life is when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, a, this is where everything goes. Well, when does that happen? How does that happen? What does that happen? I mean, here's what I know. It happens. It happens how and when of split denominations. What it looks like have split denominations. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what the Bible says and leave the gray areas to be gray areas, okay? Can we do that? Acts chapter 2, verse 39, 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me pause. Can I talk to my Pentecostals for a second? Everybody else close your ears. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and I watched my mom for seven years think she couldn't have the Holy Spirit until she saw some demonstrative power in her life, and she wept herself to sleep at night. Can I I tell you, that is not God's plan. He loves to give gifts to his children. He says, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for whom all the Lord our God will call. What is he saying? Not just for them, but that is for us. God wants to fill you with the Spirit. We can semantically disagree on what that might or might not look like. What I know is that God has a gift for you, and He wants to fill you. And I'm going to tell you how I, I think you should approach that in the coming weeks here in a moment. Let's rewind to Acts chapter 4 through 8, and then we'll read verse 9 here in a moment. This is prior to Acts chapter 2, where Jesus tells them to go and wait. The last time we see Jesus appearing to His disciples, before He would be ascended into heaven... It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, Jesus was eating with them, he gave them this command. Not suggestion, command. We could learn some things from that. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Let me just pause. There are people, I've been here. You're dying to get to a destination that you think you ought to get to, but Jesus is saying you need to wait to receive the power to take you to that destination. He goes on to say, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I'm thinking, just pause for a second. Jesus has to be going, oh, dear God, these people. 
Because you know what they were asking? What many of you ask around November every year, who's going to be our next president? Too far? They still want a political king. He's like, I died on the cross. I've been resurrected. See the nail scars. He's like, I'm just going to leave y'all to the Holy Spirit. Because he needs it. Like, y'all still want me to rebuild the kingdom. And then he says, he doesn't ignore them, but he doesn't totally address their question. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, stop asking stupid questions. I mean, I'll answer them, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Can you, what is Jerusalem to us right here, our town, our community? <laughs> then it gets wild. Now, and just before we get here, I want you to imagine. You've just spent the last three years with the Son of God on earth. You've seen him down across. You've seen him resurrected. You're like, oh, snap. And then he appears to you. And you're like, glad you're alive. I think we can do this. And he says, go and wait in Jerusalem. And then verse 9 happens. It says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Can you imagine? You're just glad Jesus is appearing. Imagine the desperation of like, what are we going to do now? He gone. Do you think you might want the Holy Spirit at that moment? Do you think you might realize we can't do this on our own? I can't live this. I struggle to live. Peter's like, when he was here, I struggled. How am I going to do it with him gone? So they went and they waited on the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So they needed power to live out their purpose. We say at Relevant Church, throw it on the screen right here. Read it with me. We are people helping people live out their purpose in Jesus Christ. Now let me pause. Oh, this is, I, this is who we are, okay? Here's the problem here, though. You, you cannot live out your purpose without the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. You can't. No counselor, no pastor, no friend, no small group, no self-help book, no crazy uncle, no broke brother-in-law, no psychotic sister. When you go and run your mouth and think you're going to live it out and all this kind of stuff, it will not help you live out your purpose without the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. It's not going to happen. And for those of you who've been struggling, you're like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to read my Bible. I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to do No, just can we just lean into the Holy Spirit and say, God, if the disciples needed it, I sure need it. And so the infilling, or what you may have heard is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, releases within us the supernatural empowerment to do all that God has called us to do. It's that simple. So let me summarize in three quick points. When I was saved, I became a new person. It went all pretty, okay? Still had to kind of grow up a little bit from the milk to the meat, what the scripture teaches, right? I had to nourish myself and learn to walk in this spiritual realm, and then learn to run, and then learn to stand strong, right? That's a new person. When I was baptized in water, symbolically, the old person was cut off. So what in the world does that mean? Well, Paul tells us from his writing to another church at Colossia. He says this in Colossians chapter number two. In him, in Jesus, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Listen, having been buried with him, what? In baptism, which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. What is Paul saying? That's all, you're like circumcision and death and stuff. Okay, just go with me. 
The Old Testament, the Jewish boys were circumcised as a covenant they made with God. You hear this? And just like that little piece of foreskin would be cut off in obedience to God, what you're saying is, when I die to my old self, Paul, it's a new covenant between God through Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. The old, I'm letting go. I'm cutting off my old self, and I'm telling the world about it. And then here's the third one. When I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I received power to walk in the new. This is where so many Christians have been living a life of defeat, frustra frustration, and failure because you need to lean into the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're in a fast. You say, what's well, a fast? We go without food, not without Facebook. We go without food, breakfast, lunch, dinner, do a Daniel fast, and we lean in. We, this is where we lean in and we say, God, would you just fill me with your Spirit? Fresh, every day I need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Are you Pentecostals? Like, when we talk about tongues, right? That's what everybody wants to know. Well, we're we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit and how they operate. But, like, listen, I don't think God's design. He didn't say go wait on some gift. He said go seek the giver. Let's just go after the Holy Spirit and trust that he'll do what he wants to in our lives, in his timing, at his moment. And you just, you lean in this week and you just, you pray. And then why don't you spend some time just waiting? Just waiting. And see what God does. When you open up your heart to receive what the Holy Spirit has. And seek him for the purposes and the power we need to live out. Watch what God does in your life. Quit trying to make it on your own. Quit trying, just lean in daily to the power of the Holy Spirit. Might look a little different. I just know there's a moment in my life where I encountered the Holy Spirit and everything changed for me. Everything. The struggles, the battles, the addictions got a whole lot easier. The things that used to upset me and make me angry got a whole lot easier. Next week, we're going to dive in. Listen, we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to talk about what Paul says about the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to look deeper into that because I'm telling you, we're going to look at what the Bible says is black and white and the gray areas. Eh, okay, it is what it is, right? Can I tell you, I don't have a corner on the market on this conversation, but we're going to look at what the Bible does teach and what the Bible does say because I want all that God has for me. Amen? Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Let me pray for you. Right now, would you open up your heart and your mind? Maybe just say, again, Holy Spirit, we lean in and ask that you would just fill us with your presence and your power. God, all across this room and watching online, even in this moment, as we lift our hands and lift our hearts, as we bow our hearts, I pray, God, that we would trust you, lean into you, ask that you would convict us through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would convince us of our righteousness found in Jesus, that you would convince us that we win when this thing is over, and also, God, that you would fill us with your power. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit as our helper. Help us to process all this stuff today and trust that you love to give good gifts to your children. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.